Up next on the Real Food Summit stage is Dr. Barry Groves. The title of his presentation is Homo Carnivorous, What We Are Designed to Eat. Barry Groves is an independent nutritional researcher, as well as a prize-winning and best-selling international author of books about diet and health. He has lived on, researched, lectured, and written about a low-carb, high-fat diet for over 50 years. He is also a director of the Foundation for Thymic Cancer Research, a founding member of the Fluoride Action Network, a founding member of Thinks, the International Network of Cholesterol Skeptics, and an honorary member of the board of the Weston A. Price Foundation. For relaxation, Barry took up archery in 1982. Between 1987 and 2007, he won 35 British championships with 21 British records and 11 gold medals at the international level, including six world championships with five world records. You can learn more about Barry at www.secondopinions.co.uk. Again, that's www.second-opinions.co.uk. Barry has elected to give his presentation without question, so here's Barry. First of all, Sean, I'd like to thank you for asking me to give this presentation, which I've called Homo Carnivorous. The spelling of carnivorous I know is wrong. It's intentional to sort of Latinize the word. Anyway, let's get on. Over the last century, dietary recommendations have been somewhat chaotic, to say the least. We went from eat more meat, milk, full cream, of course. You couldn't buy skim milk. That was fed to pigs. More eggs and more butter until the 1970s. In the UK we had fried breakfasts, we went to work on an egg, we had bread and dripping. All that changed in the 1980s when there was a complete reversal of those recommendations. And today there is a great deal of confusion about what we humans should eat to be healthy. The official line, as I'm sure everybody knows, for the last 30 years has been that we must cut down on fats particularly saturated fats, avoid red meat, and eat a diet that is based on lots of starchy cereals, bread, pasta, rice, things like that, and of course, lots of fruit and vegetables. Others point out that since we followed those recommendations over the last 30 years, obesity, diabetes, and a host of other diseases have all increased dramatically. They say we should cut down on carbs and eat more fat. I'm one of this latter group and I want to tell you why I believe that our current so-called healthy ideas are so wrong and what we can do to regain our true health potential. Now to do this I want to look at our history and at the way our bodies work. So if you ask the question what should we eat, the answer surely is we should eat what we're designed to eat. The question then is what are we designed to eat? What is our natural diet? Many claims have been made stating that the natural diet of humans is or should be all sorts of things. They vary widely from carnivore to vegetarian to fruitarian. There are even people called breatharians who believe it's possible to live just by breathing. You can get all the proteins, minerals, energy, you know, everything you need without eating anything at all. Seriously, they do exist. Probably not for very long. Others will say perhaps that we're all of them, that we're all individuals. One size doesn't fit all. Um, you have to have a diet designed specially for you personally because we're all different. And this has led to another fad called body typing. Well, to see which one of these is correct, I think we must look at human diets from prehistory and at cross cultural dietary comp comparisons of um, primitive and modern societies. It's also useful to consider the diets of mankind's nearest relatives, the other primates, because we are a primate, and at how our bodies are designed. The first point to note is that this topic should not be at all difficult. We've made it complex, but nature is really simple. Do wild animals in their natural environment require instruction or frequent bulletins from a department of health to guide them in their choice of food? Of course not. When did a primitive tribesman consult a calorie chart before deciding what and how much he should eat? They eat what comes naturally to them and in the quantities they want and whenever they like. And it really is quite simple. Herbivore 
are animals which seek, seek and eat plant food and carnivorous animals hunt and eat the plant eaters. Really, nature is not complicated. Wild animals are perfect examples of optimum nutrition resulting from their respective correct diet, balanced diets and that applies equally to humans. And body typing is nonsense. All members of a species are designed exactly the same and for, the same, for that reason they are all designed to eat exactly the same foods. So all rabbits eat grass. You'd never get a pregnant rabbit thinking to herself hmm I think I need a bit more protein for my fetus I think I'll go and kill a mouse. It would never happen. Similarly all lions eat zebras and antelopes and other animals and you wouldn't get one thinking to itself Phew, that meal is a bit rich I think I'll go and pick some fruit. Again it would never happen. We humans are also all one species Homo sapiens and we're all designed to eat exactly the same food. Although I will allow that some are more able to tolerate unnatural foods than others. So, we should all eat a similar diet. The question now is, what is that diet? There's no argument that we need to eat proteins and vitamins and minerals and so on, but for energy we have a choice between carbohydrates and fats. Which is better? Does it matter? To answer the question, I want us to consider what other mammals eat. On this slide I've got six different mammals. I've got cattle and sheep uh, to the left in the middle. Um, they eat grass and veggies and things that grow in the in meadows. Below the cattle we've got a gorilla which also only eats leaves from uh, about 200 different varieties of plant. Next to the gorilla we've got lions which eat normally warm-blooded animals, uh, antelopes, zebras and so on which we know um, have saturated fat in them and uh, the uh, polar bear eats seals which of course are very fatty and the Maasai warrior above the seal lives in his natural state on the blood and milk of his cattle and the milk is a very high fat milk about 8% fat as opposed to our 3 to 4% fat so which of these animals do you think eats a high fat diet is designed to eat a high fat diet well, I want to look first of all at the gorilla's diet. From every kilogram that a gorilla eats, about 90% of it is water. Gorillas don't need to drink. They get all the water they need from the, the leaves that they eat. That leaves 10% um, or 100 grams of dry matter, of which on average 11.8 grams is protein, 7.7 .7 grams available carbohydrates, by which I mean carbo um, starches and sugars and half a gram of fat and that translates to 81 and a half calories which isn't very much from a kilogram of food and it also breaks down to 58 percent protein 37 percent um, carbohydrates and only five percent fats in calorie terms so yeah it looks like a low fat diet but it isn't actually quite as simple as that you see about 74% of the dry matter on average in the gorilla's diet is vegetable fiber and the gorilla is what's known as a hind gut digester. Now hind gut digesters digest and absorb proteins the available carbs and fats just as humans do through the stomach and the small intestine. The undigested vegetable fiber in their diet then passes to the cecum and colon or large intestine which house huge colonies of bacteria and it's here that the fiber is fermented to produce short chain fatty acids which are then absorbed into the body to be used as energy and they do that at a rate of about two kilocalories per gram of fiber and this changes the whole picture if we refer back to the energy figures from the last a couple of slides ago we must now add the short chain fatty acids 148 kilocalories and these almost treble the total energy which the gorilla gets from its diet which makes it look a bit more sustainable but it does more than that it alters the whole macronutrient profile the gorilla now is eating a diet which is only 20 percent protein 13 percent carbohydrate and a full two-thirds of its diet 
comes from fats. And since all short-chain fatty acids are 100% saturated, that's almost entirely saturated fat. The gorilla's diet is not a low-fat diet at all. It's a very high-fat diet. If we move on to the cattle and sheep, these are ruminants. And these are foregut digesters. Now, ruminants evolved to eat roughage, grasses and shrubs, built predominantly of cellulose. We can't use these, but these animals can. They include the large grazing animals, um, not just the cattle and uh, sheep, but also goats, deer, antelope. And there's even a primate, the columnus monkey, one of our um, class of animals, which is a, um, a ruminant. Now, in ruminants, the major organ of fermentation is the same sort of process as in the gorilla, but it, goes in, it happens in their stomach or perhaps I should say stomachs, as there tends to be separate compartments which collectively oper um, occupy about three-fourths of the abdominal cavity. Quite how a calf <laughs> is <laughs> held in there till it's born beats me. Anyway, this multiple stomach also employs bacteria. Coming first in the directive, the digestive tract, the stomach not only ferments fiber to produce short-chain fatty acids, it also ferments starches and sugars, the available carbohydrates. This, of course, reduces the amount of um, glucose which is absorbed, but it increases the amount of uh, short-chain fatty acids from a given amount of plant food, such that, to quote a veterinary textbook, short-chain fatty acids are produced in large amounts through ruminal fermentation and are of paramount importance in that they provide greater than 70% of the ruminants' energy supply. In this way, ruminants have a diet which is actually even higher in fats than the um, gorilla and contain practically no carbohydrates at all. We've got between 70 and 80% calories from fat, 20 to 30 protein, as I say, no carbohydrates. Now, all herbivores utilize one or other of these two methods of getting energy from what looks like a pretty energy deficient food source. It seems clear, therefore, that the metabolisms of all of them are adapted to utilize short chain fatty acids as their major energy source rather than glucose, and that they are actually designed and adapted to live on a high fat, moderate protein, low or no carbohydrate diet. Going on to carnivores, such as lions, tigers, dogs, cats, wolves, hyenas. These are quite unable to use fiber as an energy source in the same way that herbivores do. But it doesn't matter, because the carnivores are adapted to eat the herbivores. Now it's noticeable that carnivorous animals tend to go for the fattier parts of their prey. When they've killed an animal, they go straight into the guts. If a lion leaves anything at all, it will be the non-fatty lower legs, bits like that. And so along come hyenas whose jaws and teeth are designed to break the long bones to get at the bone marrow inside, which is very high in fat. So the carnivores have also adapted to eat a high fat, no carbohydrate diet. And it's actually not very different from the ruminants in profile. It's 70 to 80 percent fats, 20 to 30 percent protein, and again, no carbohydrates. So where do we humans fit into the picture? Well, the first thing to note is that we are just as much an animal as any of the others when it comes to diet. And there's no reason to suppose that we need to treat ourselves any differently. This is borne out by observations by anthropologists and medical missionaries over a couple of centuries who all related that primitive human cultures also ate and preferred high-fat diets. The people like uh, Wilhelm Moore Stephenson and Admiral Peary with the Eskimos and the Inuit, Western Price all over the world, of course, and Earl Parker Hansen, who did a lot of work um, in Africa and in South America with the Indians. So it's quite clear that all mammals eat, or designed to eat, high-fat diets. And that includes us. Okay. So we now know that we should eat a high-fat diet. The question now is, where should those fats come from? Should we eat a plant-based vegan diet? 
or a meat-based carnivore diet? I want to start answering that question by looking at other mammals again. And as we're a primate species, we'll start with our nearest relatives, the other primates. Apart from us, Homo sapiens, there are 192 other species of primate alive today. Now many people believe that we're the only one that's carnivorous, that all of the others are vegetarian, and some suggest, because of our similarities, we too are really a vegetarian species. Well, this was certainly the belief until Jane Goodall published her research in the 1960s. It had been assumed that chimpanzees ate only plant foods, but Goodall discovered that they chase, catch, kill and eat monkeys, baby bazoons, baboons and other small animals. And the picture here is of a chimpanzee eating a colobus monkey. In the mid-1970s, about a decade later, Diane Fossey and Richard Perry also showed that other great apes, gibbons, orangutans and baboons, also kill and eat small animals regularly. And the most primitive primate of them all, the tarsia, or tree shrew, is entirely carnivorous. Now these studies led to primates being reclassified as omnivores. But if other primates eat meat, there is no reason why we shouldn't. In fact, we seem to have taken carnivory to the extreme. The evidence for this is overwhelming. We can trace human evolution from remains and artifacts of early hominids found in Africa, our ancestors, and other parts of the world for millions of years. We have fossilized bone records, both of our hominid ancestors and of animals. And we have found stone tools and implements which are best suited to killing and cutting flesh. The first evidence lies in the fossil sites of Africa, widely accepted as our birthplace. Here, where hominid remains are found, so also are animal bones, sometimes in their thousands. If those hominids were not meat eaters, why is that? Next, there are cave paintings in many parts of Africa, Europe, Asia, the Americas and Australia, which depict hunting scenes. I've got a selection of them here. Now, it's quite obvious these people are hunting the animals. They're not going to be looking on them as pets. It's also very obvious, because they went to a lot of trouble to paint these pictures, that hunting and animals were important to them. Wherever you look throughout the world, you will not find a cave painting like these of a fruit tree or fruit anywhere. And we also have hominid faeces, which are called coprolites. These have been found to contain just about anything that will come from an animal, but won't digest. Fish bones, heads, small animal bones, bird feathers, eggshells, and so on. But in coprolites found before 50,000 years ago, no plant material such as fibre and seeds. And this finding is highly significant. Most plants reproduce with seeds. Many of these seeds are designed to be eaten by animals, to pass unaffected through the animal's digestive system without harm, and pass out the other end to be deposited in a nice lump of manure to take root somewhere else. The fact that no seeds have been found in human or hominid coprolites means that our ancestors cannot have eaten them. But I think the most important evidence of all comes from studies of our brains. I've called it, uh, if you want to get a head, get a brain. Because our brains are truly enormous. But they weren't always that big. Measuring cranial cavities of hominid fossils, we found that in be those between about 6 million years ago and 2.5 uh, million years ago, brain sizes remained fairly constant for that three and a half million years. Then, became a, then began a spectacular increase in size when our brains increased to four times the size from about 350 milliliters to over 1500 milliliters. So we have another question, why? What happened about two and a half million years ago which could have had such a dramatic effect? Well, several people have come up with different answers.
The answer, I think, lies in the subject which is very topical today, climate change. About two and a half million years ago, the world cooled down and a series of ice ages began which lasted until only a few thousand years ago. For that two and a half million years, even places close to the equator would have had a climate similar to that of Greenland today. With long cold winters and short cool summers, there would have been very few plant foods available for much of the year that our ancestors could have eaten. It was inevitable that animal food should occupy an increasingly prominent place in our ancestors' menus. Animals such as the reindeer of today have the ability to nozzle underneath the snow to find and eat mosses and lichens which are found there. We can't eat them, of course, but they can. It was the same then. Just as the Sami do today, there is very little doubt that our ancestors must have relied on those animals for their food. They would have followed animals like the reindeer around and eaten the animals who were eating the mosses and so on. We also have a change in, mole, in teeth size. We have smaller molar sizes, less robust uh, facial muscles and alterations in incisor shape from that time which also confirm a greater emphasis on foods such as meat that requires less grinding and more tearing. And we know what animals were around at that time. We have flat-faced bears, woolly rhino, woolly mammoths and so on. And all these animals carried a lot of body fat. An increasing proportion of meat in the diet would obviously have provided more animal protein, a uh, factor perhaps related to the increase in stature which accompanied the transition from Ocelopithecines through Homo habilis to Homo erectus and modern man. All Ice Age animals also carried substantial amounts of body fats, both as insulation against the cold and as energy reserves. Uh, this greater availability of animal fat was a more Im important dietary alteration, I think. We know that early hominids broke skulls and long bones to get at the brain and marrow fats from a broad range of animals. These and other carcass fats were probably as much prized by them as they are by modern human hunter-gatherers today. Not only did more animal fat in the diet mean considerably more energy, it was also a source of ready-made long-chain fatty acids including the 20 and 22 carbon chain fatty acids, arachidonic acid, docosatetanoic acid, and docosahexanoic acid, which are together make up over 90% of the fatty acids found in the brain matter of all mammalian species. This again is highly significant because 20 and 22 carbon fatty acids are essential for brain development and they are not found in vegetable fats. The longest chain in any vegetable oils are linoleic acid, which is the omega-6 EFA, and alpha-linolenic acid, which is the omega-3. But these are only 18 carbon fatty acids. Now, we do have an ability, just like all mammals, to chain elongate and desaturate these to produce the longer chain fatty acids, but we're not very good at it. I'm quoting here from a study, humans maintain an inefficient ability to chain elongate and desaturate 18 carbon fatty acids to their product 20 and 22 carbon fatty acids. Preformed dietary 20 and 22 carbon fatty acids were increasingly incorporated in lieu of endogenously synthesized fats derived from 18 carbon plant fatty acids. Our brain growth could never have happened if we hadn't eaten animal brain fats. At this point I want to introduce Dr. Max Kleiber. Zookeepers in the middle of the last century wanted some means of assessing how much food they needed to stock for different animals. Food was expensive and if it wasn't used in time it would go off. Now they obviously didn't want to overstock and on the other hand they couldn't afford to run out. So they needed somebody to work out how much they needed to keep. And Max Kleiber, a doctor of science, got the job.
He studied a wide range of animals and he found that the bigger the animal was, the more food it ate. Not surprising. But the relationship wasn't simply a case of double the size, double the amount. He found that the amount of food required approximated to the animal's metabolic rate to the power 0.75. And this ratio became known as Kleiber's law. Kleiber's law also applies to the sizes of energy producing or using organs within the body, the heart, the brain, the liver, the gut, muscles and so on. Now the size of any organ that is directly concerned with metabolic turnover should comply with Kleiber's law. If we measure the size of these, and they are in accordance with Kleiber's law, each part's quotient will be 1. A quotient greater than 1 means the organ is larger than expected, and a quotient less than 1 indicates a size smaller than expected. The brain is an organ which should comply with Kleiber's law. If we look at our brains and subject them to Kleiber's law, we find that they're almost seven and a half times as big as would be expected for an animal of our size. Now that's huge. But if we then look at the amount of energy they use, the quotient is nearly 30 times as large as would be expected. And that is truly colossal. And it brings up another question. Where does the enormous amount of energy our brains need come from? Now, unless you're a breatharian, of course, the only place it can come from is the food we eat. So, you either need a very large gut with a large absorptive surface, or you need a very energy-dense diet, or, of course, both. So, have we got a large gut? Well, no. Quite the reverse, in fact. Using Kleiber's law, we find that our gut is actually much smaller than would be expected in an animal of our size. Our stomach, for example, is only about a third as big as would be expected. Our small intestine is only three quarters, and that's where most of the food is uh, absorbed. Our cecum is practically non-existent. You can see it there. We, we call it an appendix, about the size of a little finger. And our colon is only just over half what would be expected. Now, all of these values are considerably less than one. Now, this is particularly obvious in the case of the cecum. The cecum is part of the gut between the small and large intestines, which is present in all mammals, but with differing sizes depending on the mammal's natural food supply. Hindgut digesters, um, like the gorilla, have a large cecum, hosting billions of bacteria which break down plant materials such as cellulose. Exclusive carnivores, whose diets contain little or no plant material, have a much smaller cecum, often partially or wholly replaced by the vermiform, as it's called, appendix. And this is the case in humans. This is quite obvious when we compare the gorilla with the man in the picture I've got there. Look at the size of the gorilla's abdomen compared with a man's. This is because the gorilla's large abdomen is mostly cecum and colon, which in humans is very small. As a consequence, we absorb very little nutrition from our colons. Perhaps surprisingly, our energy intake is actually in accordance with Kleiber's law. We do eat about the same amount as any other animal our size. Our brain is only 2% of total body weight, but it uses as much as a quarter of our total resting energy. Um, and because it's so huge, something else has to suffer. This is why our gut is so small, and other energy-using organs such as the heart, liver, and muscles are also so puny compared to other animals. If we put all this together, we can only come to one conclusion. For the absorption of sufficient energy and nutrients for our bodies to function properly, our food must be very nutrient and energy dense. Now, the only macronutrient with sufficient concentrated energy for this is fat. And fat meat is the only practical source, as eating plants would increase the consumption of carbohydrates and fibre. And indeed, we have a very long love affair with fat. Now, while I don't regard the Bible as a, be as a scientific work, it does tell us what the peoples of the Middle East believed two to three thousand years ago, 
and what they liked to eat. The first indication that fat was prized comes from Genesis with the story of Cain and Abel and the account of the first recorded offering to Jehovah. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, in other words he was a carnivore if you like, but Cain was a tiller of the ground, he was a vegetarian. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. This story tells us two things. Firstly, it represents the preferences of the Hebrew people themselves when they were living in the region of Babylon and Egypt. Meat and fat were regarded as superior to vegetables. Secondly, the inclusion of the words and of the fat thereof means that Abel didn't only bring lambs but also more fat separately as an added superior gift. Biblical sheep, by the way, were the fat-tailed sheep um, which I've got pictures of there. They were prized highly in biblical times and they're still found in Syria and Palestine today. And further on in Genesis, we learn by inference that both Jews and Egyptians thought well of a high fat diet and Pharaoh said unto Joseph take your father and your households and come unto me and I will give you of the good of the land of Egypt and ye shall eat the fat of the land. From other passages of the Old Testament we know that the Israelites were thinking of fat mutton or of mutton fat when they spoke of the fat of the land. The Bible tells us that mutton fat was considered the most delicious portion of any meat and the tail and adjacent part the most exquisite morsel in the whole body. And from Isaiah 25, 6, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, of fat things full of marrow. And that's not vegetable marrow, that's bone marrow. The New Testament also has similar references, and we learn that beef fat was also held in high esteem. When the prodigal son returned home, his father didn't welcome him with an ordinary calf. He slew a fatted calf. When Christianity sped northwards, the biblical phrase to live on the fat of the land would have been readily understood across Europe. Across the Mediterranean from the Holy Lands, the Greeks too liked their meat fat and believed that their heroes preferred it. You won't find a kind word about lean meat in the poems of Homer, but they're larded with praise of fat meats. Take the Iliad, written about 850 BC, in which we read of Agamemnon, who slew a fat bull of five years to the most mighty Cronian, and Patroclos cast down a great fleshing block in the firelight, and laid thereon a sheep's back, and a fat goat's, and a great hog's chine, rich with fat. We find the same in the religious and profane classics of northern European peoples, preserved in the Scandinavian Eddas and Sagas. One Icelandic poem reads, There, in Valhalla, in paradise, the feast will be set with clear wine, fat and marrow. Again, that's bone marrow, not the vegetable kind. And the earliest Indo-European scriptures The Vedas Upanishads from around 2000 BC also contain some very interesting observations regarding food. Meat, both wild and domestic, was highly prized despite the fact that agriculture was also practiced at that time. There were many references to clashes between tribes in protecting the forest where wild game was available. And it's actually interesting that some of the old medical manuals were so sophisticated as to give us insights into the problem of tooth decay in the early days of agriculture, loyalty of the period with abundant access to sweet and acidic fruit had famous toothaches. Uh, Medicine men with narcotic painkillers were in very high demand in those days. And it's the same south of the equator. The Norwegian explorer and scientist Dr. Carl Lumholst reported the same was true in the southern hemisphere. When he was with the tropical forest dwelling Aborigines of northern Australia, Lumholst tells how they lived mainly on animal food 
and never ate anything from a plant source if flesh was available. Lumholz also noted that the Aborigines ate their meals rather like children will, the best bits first. And that was always the meat, and the fatter the meat the better. In the 20th century, Sir George Hubert Wilkins, Australia's most famous explorer, conducted a two-year expedition for the British Museum in Northern Australia, and Sir George confirmed Lomholtz's findings, and added certain observations along the same line. The Aborigines were cannibals, and the missionaries were having some difficulty breaking them of this habit. Sir George noted that when a thin man died, all that was needed was a stern word from the missionaries, and they would leave the corpse alone. But when a fat man was buried, the missionaries had to stand and watch over the grave for a very long time, because even after some months, the Aborigines would dig up fat corpses. And there are many other peoples today who live on nothing but meat. The Lapsan Sami of northern Scandinavia, the peoples of Siberia, the Inuit of Greenland, and the Canadian North all live entirely on animals and fish even today. The American Plains Indians ate buffalo, either fresh or made into pemmican, until only a century ago, and they were all of these were healthier than they are now. Many peoples in the tropics also eat a carnivorous diet, marsh Arabs, Berbers, Naga, Maasai, Samburu, and so on. South American gauchos, I've got one there on the right, who are largely European stock, also live almost exclusively on beef, and there are many, many more. In Britain, we also used to like fat. In English speech, fat food was called rich food. This was the highest praise. In 19th century Britain, the most esteemed part of the diet was fat. Describing good meat, Mrs. Beaton, in her book of household management, which was written in 1861, said, beef of the best quality is of a deep red color, and when the animal has approached maturity and has been well fed, the lean is intermixed with fat, giving it the mottled appearance which is so much esteemed. If meat didn't have much fat, that was a sign of poor quality. And to my mind, it still is. A piece of meat there, by the way, is a piece from an Ang Aberdeen Angus I had a little while ago. And dietary recommendations in this country, shaped by Sir John Boyd Orr's work, advising a high-fat diet well into the second half of the 20th century. Now, many people are told, particularly in America, that the Mediterranean diet is particularly healthy. This, they're told, is because the people in the Mediterranean countries eat olive oil. Well, I spend four months of every year in the Mediterranean country, and I know what they really eat. Yes, they eat olive oil, but they eat a lot more butter. The Spanish spread pork fat, or lard, thickly on their tostadas for breakfast. Pate, sausages, salamis, chorizo, etc. are all more than 50% animal fat. Cheeses come between 60 and as much as 80% fat. The cream, which I've got on the top right there, has a minimum of 31% fat. Unfortunately, 31 a 35.1 is also the maximum. At home I use, in Britain I use British double cream which is 48%. But you can also buy fat meat, those two pork chops there, as you can see about a third fat, and very fat bacon. That's the real Mediterranean diet. To summarize then, this evidence tells us that fat has played a major part in the diets of peoples of every inhabited continent across the globe, from the Arctic to the equator, and from primitive to civilized, for the whole of our existence as a species. As my mentor, the late Dr. John Yudkin, once said, fat is the most valuable food known to man. But with the advent of healthy eating, all that seems to have been forgotten, changing so radically from our accustomed high-fat diet to one unnaturally low in fat, not only have we lost the benefits from the fats we used to eat, we've replaced them with a source of energy for which we are genetically ill-prepared. Carbohydrates, starches, sugars, fruit. And carbohydrates are very far from healthy. The polyunsaturated margarines and cooking oils we now eat because we mustn't eat saturated fat 
are also very different from those of our evolutionary background. Now, with that background, it's no wonder that the present-day dietary recommendations are having the effects we can see all around us, but it shows in other ways. Our ancestors' brain size reached its peak with the first anatomically modern humans of approximately 90,000 years ago. They then remained pretty fairly constant for a further 60,000 years. Over the next 20,000 years, there was a very slight decline in brain size of about 3%. And then the rate of shrinkage quickened markedly from about 10,000 years ago. So again, we have to ask the question, why? Well, 10,000 years ago was the time when the last ice age finished and the world began to warm up. It was the beginning of an agricultural revolution, a transition from nomadic hunting and gathering communities and bands to a more settled life of agriculture and animal husbandry and it had it heralded a dramatic change in our lifestyles and our food supplies. There was an enormous drop in consumption of high-energy, fat-rich foods of animal origin, from over 90% of the diet to as little as 10% today. And that was coupled with a large rise in grain consumption, cereals, which are not only less energy-dense, but also deficient in vitamins, minerals, essential amino acids and fatty acids. Today, cereals are by far the largest source of food in the world, far bigger than all the other classes put together. And meat, even if you include uh, milk and eggs, comes a very lowly fourth. We probably eat more sugar than meat today, and the meat that we do eat will be lean with the fat cut off. And it shows. Over the period, our brains have shrunk by 11%. Other things in history have also helped destroy our brains. About 200 years ago, the Industrial Revolution heralded a second dietary revolution, which had two powerful but opposite effects on our health. Industrialized countries where their increased wealth no longer had to rely on home-produced seasonally dependent foods, they could import what they wanted and to look forward to going through life without ever having to be hungry again. Until then, we ate the fruit that we could pick from hedgerows, blackberries, sloes, crab apples, all of which are not very sweet. With the international commerce, however, came new, sweeter fruits, which tasted nicer. As a consequence, people changed from eating what they needed to eating what they liked. And if they still ate the indigenous fruits, they put sugar on. The next change in our diet, it speeded up much quicker when a new disease, which we now call coronary heart disease, or CHD, suddenly took off in the 1920s across the industrialized world and became a major cause of premature death. This graph I've got here is from England and Wales. Graphs for the um, United States and other industrial countries are something similar. Now this new disease was very worrying because doctors really hadn't got a clue what was causing it. In 1953, an American doctor, Ansel Keys, used data from six countries to prove, he said, that increasing levels of fat eaten was the cause of the rise in coronary heart disease in those countries. This study, however, is quite fraudulent. At the time Keyes did the study, in 1953 or the early 1950s, there were data from 22 countries he could have used he didn't use those which didn't fit with what he wanted to show. Now I've put two of them in here for only one, well two reasons really. They both begin with the same letter and they're both European. These are France and Finland. As you can see, Finland has about ten times as many heart deaths as France even though the Finns actually ate slightly less fat. And if you use all the data replotted four years later it is clear that there's absolutely no correlation at all between fat intakes and heart disease. Nevertheless, the fat causes heart disease hypothesis was persuasive. If Keyes was right, that gave the doctors an easy out. All they had to say was, don't eat so much fat and you'll be all right. Although this has never been proven, it still rules our lives today. So we have evolved over several hundreds of thousands of years to eat and cope with animal fat. Despite this, doctors argue that the cause of heart disease is too much animal fat. 
Surgeon Captain Trevor Cleave, back in the 1960s, said, however, for a modern disease to be related to an old-fashioned food is one of the most ludicrous things I ever heard in my life. Of course, he's right. They also say that it's a result of a lack of polyunsaturated plant oils, such as corn oil, safflower and sunflower and canola oils. But think about it. How can this present epidemic be caused through a lack of something we've never eaten? And then in the 1980s, healthy eating was introduced and we had carbohydrate-based, low-fat foods and things got worse for our health even quicker with healthy eating, which recommended this sort of a diet. And we can see the consequences of this all around us. There's been a dramatic rise in a whole range of diseases. Obesity is the most obvious one. Diabetes, heart disease, we get three times as many cancers now as when healthy eating was first introduced, and there are many more. And then in the late 20th century, the pace at which our diet became increasingly unnatural quickened. Science made possible the production of synthetic foods that had the appearance, texture and taste of the real thing, but very few of the essentials, the proteins, the fats, the vitamins, the minerals, and so on. Give you an example, I like cream in my coffee and on fruit. So when I was in the States um, a few years ago, I tried to buy some, only to find abominations like fat-free sour cream. Now, how can you have a fat-free cream when cream is fat? Just look at it. <laughs> I read the label. It said, cultured low-fat milk, modified cornstarch, whey protein concentrate, propylene glycol monoester, artificial color, gelatin, sodium phosphate, agar gum, xanthan gum, sodium citrate, locust bean gum, vitamin A palmitate. Just look at those. It doesn't contain any real food at all, just a mixture of rubbish and chemicals. It's no wonder we're becoming so ill. And then a study published in Neurology in 2008 showed that our brains are now shrinking much faster still. This was a five-year study of volunteers aged between 61 and 87. Their brains were scanned and measured for the size at the beginning of the study, and they also had blood tests taken um, to measure a number of things, including vitamin B12, which only comes from animals, which would give an indication of how much meat and animal products they ate. At the end of the study, their brains were tested again, and so were their blood, and significant levels of brain shrinkage were seen. Those eating a meat-free diet were six times more likely to suffer brain shrinkage, and vegans, who don't of course eat anything from animals, had the most shrinkage, which was more than 5% over the five years. Uh, so think about it, if you can lose 5% of your brain in five years, if you were a vegan for 20 years, how much would you lose? I, I had to thought about this, and I had a look at the sizes of the brains and the various people at the beginning of the trial, and I found that the smallest brain in somebody eating a normal diet was actually bigger than the biggest brain of a vegan. Worryingly though, all participants had vitamin B12s which were within what was regarded as a normal range. This suggests strongly that what we consider to be normal is actually way too low. We need to raise the standard and to do that we need to eat more meat, not less. Incidentally, if you're still worried about fat and heart disease, these two graphs should reassure you. From the World Health Organization, they show that in Europe, the countries which have the highest fat intakes are the ones with the lowest numbers of deaths from heart disease. So to conclude, the totality of evidence points to our being basically a carnivorous species. But obviously we can survive by opportunist use of plant foods if meat is scarce. Does this make us omnivores? Well, perhaps. But we have no need, biological or biochemical, for any plant foods at all. I want to leave you with a few thoughts now. First of all, do you realize that we civilized humans are the planet's only chronically sick animal? No wild animal or human culture living on its natural diet suffers the chronic diseases we do. Most of them don't even get infections. Another fact, our pets suffer the same diseases we do, and for the same reasons. 
We feed carnivorous animals, dogs and cats, on rice and biscuits and healthy vegetables and chocolates. Wherever we travel in the world, we export our dietary dogma. And that makes previously healthy populations as ill as we are by contact with us. You've probably seen in zoos, if you've been there, notices which say, don't, please don't feed the animals. Now, there's a very good reason for this. Feeding fruit and things like bread to herbivores such as a gorilla is the equivalent of feeding them a high-carb, low-fat diet. And that diet increases the risk of a heart attack in gorillas in exactly the same way as it does with us. Incidentally, um, if you think we should emulate the gorilla, and a lot of people do, you might like to know that gorillas have the highest intake of plants of all the primates and the smallest brains for their size. So, we have a problem. We civilized people forget that for millions of years before we began to acquire the assets of civilization, we ate an animal-based high-fat diet with little or no plant material in it. It's certain that nature gave us a similar innate wisdom to choose foods which best suited us. So long as they remained nutritionally ignorant and uninformed, our ancestors did a pretty creditable job of selecting their diet. If they hadn't, we wouldn't be here today. But today all that has changed. We're led by people who, <laughs> if they live by their own recommendations, will have small brains. It is they who tell us to eat a diet for which we're not adapted, a diet that lies at the root of the dramatic increases in previously rare or unknown chronic diseases such as cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, obesity, diabetes and so on. The answer to that, I think, is fairly simple and obvious. We must return to our traditional diet. That's a diet based on fat meat with small amounts, if you like, of non-starchy vegetables and nuts and even smaller amounts of fruit. But above all, we need to eat real fresh food. And just a closing thought. Civilized man is the only animal clever enough to manufacture its own food and the only animal stupid enough to eat it. Thank you for listening.